So we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. And the first thing that we have to ask is, what is the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus announced that the kingdom of God is coming as a great cosmic event and that it'll change everything about the world and set everything in the world right. And that we, as Jesus followers, have to make sure that we're ready for that event. In Luke chapter 21, verse 25, it says, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. But Jesus also announced that the kingdom of God is already here, right in front of us, if we can learn to see it. And he taught that if we can learn to see it, we are invited to live in the kingdom of God and enjoy its blessings right now. In Luke chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus said, Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is already among you. So those two ideas really seem to contradict each other. And we have to ask, what are we supposed to do with Jesus' teaching on the kingdom of God? It's a great big cosmic event that's coming any day now, but it's also right here among us. So it was the most important part of Jesus' message when he went to preach. But there's some confusion there because those ideas seem to contradict each, contradict each other. Are we supposed to wait for the kingdom? Are we supposed to build the kingdom? Are we supposed to live in the kingdom? Are we supposed to be the kingdom? And for a long time, Christians have understood the kingdom of God like this. Wherever people obey the will of God, wherever they comply with God's vision for humanity, the kingdom of God is there. And so if we expand the territory where people know God and obey God, then that means we're expanding the kingdom of God, right? If the kingdom of God is wherever God is king, and we make God king in as many places as possible, that means the kingdom of God is growing, right? It sounds good, and it gives us something to do. So let's get busy. Let's build great big churches and evangelize our neighbors, right? Expanding the kingdom of God. Let's send missionaries to convert all those faraway tribes and expand the kingdom of God. Let's work Christian values into our government and its laws to force obedience to God's law on our fellow citizens because that's expanding the kingdom of God. And we're starting to get into trouble. Let's conquer those faraway tribes and force them to act like our version of Christians because that's expanding the kingdom of God, right? Let's purify the kingdom of God and burn all those heretics and atheists and scientists and all those people that don't agree with us, right? Just like Jesus taught us to do, right? No. No. There are two huge problems with that idea of our kingdom or our idea of the kingdom of God. The idea that we can expand it through force and through effort. The first problem is that Jesus and John the Baptist and all the apostles, they never tried to build the kingdom of God. They went places and they announced that the kingdom of God was coming and that it was already here. And they tried to help people see the kingdom of God among them. And they invited people into the kingdom of God, but they never tried to organize it. And they never tried to expand it. They announced that it was here and that it was expanding. But they didn't have the idea that it was their responsibility to make it bigger. And the other problem is that every time Christians throughout history have gotten serious about building the kingdom of God, we've always ended up violent and corrupted, and we've completely lost the message of Jesus. And I'm going to tell some stories about this later so that we can all get on the same page. But everything that Jesus said about the kingdom of God tells us that God does not need or want or depend on our help to create the kingdom of God. And just so you know, I looked up every single passage in the New Testament that mentions the kingdom of God. Do you know how many times the New Testament tells us to build the kingdom of God? Zero times. It never says it once that it's our responsibility to expand or create the kingdom of God on earth. And so the kingdom of God is not going to be the result of all of our hard work. It's on its way, whether we like it or not, because God has established it and God will establish it finally by his own power 
and without our help. And that hope that one day God will set all of creation right himself by coming here and doing it. That's the foundation of the New Testament, and it's the foundation of our faith. But over the years, the foundation of almost everything that we've done as church people has been that idea that it's up to us to build and expand and manage the kingdom of God for God through our own intelligence and effort. And that means that the Christian faith, the message of the Christian faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the announcement of the kingdom has traveled around the world several times by now and touched the lives of millions and billions of people. But it also means that precious few of those people ever got to enjoy the blessings of living in the kingdom of God because we were so busy trying to build the kingdom of God that we completely missed what the kingdom of God actually is and its presence right among us. Jesus warned us about this. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, he said, The gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss the hidden path to life. And I don't want to miss the kingdom of God that's right here in front of me and all around me and within me and among us. And I don't want us as a body of Christ to miss the kingdom of God among us either. So that's what I want us to work on for the next few weeks. We're going to work on seeing the kingdom of God that's already here all around us. We're going to look at Jesus teaching about the kingdom, and we're going to learn where and when the kingdom of God is, who has access to the kingdom of God in the future and right now, how the kingdom of God compares to the kingdoms of this world, who's in charge and how honor works in the kingdom of God, why the kingdom of God has its own illogical math and how that math works, what the kingdom of God looks like and feels like right now among us, what the kingdom of God will look like when it finally arrives in the future, and how you and me can see and participate in the kingdom of God that's all around us already. And this is so exciting because this right here is the heart of everything that Jesus taught. And it's also something that once you get it, once it clicks, it can really change everything about your life and the way that you see the world and the way you participate in the world and the way you relate to other people and the way that you feel about yourself. And it's also exciting because the best way to have our eyes open to the kingdom of God is not to go through it theologically piece by piece. It's just to tell a bunch of stories, and that's what we're going to do. So if you have the Bible app open, I've got some pictures of the kingdom of God in the Bible app, and I'm going to tell you some stories. The first one, and they didn't know that I was going to share this, so I'm sorry if I embarrass them. Hermanos, perdóname si... Eh, les doy pena, pero voy a contar la historia de lo que pasó la semana pasada cuando nos conocemos bien. ¿Sí? So, these are our new friends, Jaime and Maricela. Everybody say hi, Jaime. Hi, Maricela. Let's do that thing. When I count to three, shout your name at them. One, two, three. Yeah, now we know each other officially. Yeah. This is Jaime and Maricela. They came to our church uh, a couple weeks ago, and they were looking for a place to get married. And I said, come talk to me during the week. And we'll talk about what our version of marriage is and how we understand that. And the night before, we were having class with the youth group over in the gazebo. And a pan bimbo truck, a bimbo bread truck, showed up behind the church. A box truck with the little bimbo bear on it. And a guy started offloading an entire truck's worth of bread into our church. And that was when I lost the attention of our students because you can't watch somebody unloading a bread truck and still keep going with a lesson, right? I mean, if it happened right now, you guys wouldn't be paying attention to me. Um, so we're watching them and trying to figure it out. And I went up to the driver afterward and I said, what is all this? And he said, well, you know, I wanted to donate all this bread to the church so you guys can give it away to people who need it. So awesome. That's great. So the next day, Thursday, Allison was on the phone all day trying to make sure that the bread got where it needed to go. And it was like an entire convenience store worth of bread. And so they spent all day that Thursday with people showing up and taking bread. Some bread went to Reynosa. Some bread went to the Bible Institute. And there were all these places around the community where bread was needed and bread arrived. So Jaime and Maricela show up that afternoon to talk to me. And uh, I had just got the COVID, the first COVID vaccine uh, dose and I was feeling kind of woozy but I said okay let's we made this appointment let's talk and in talking to them uh, they told me that um, 
over the course of their lives, no one had ever really told them the story of Jesus and how to, how to confess our sins to Christ and how to receive the spirit of Christ into our hearts. And so I told them that story, and they wanted that for themselves, and they accepted the Lord that day. And I was so excited that I took them into the back uh, room where we had all the bread and where the ladies were at distributing the bread. I said, look, these are our new brothers and sisters in Christ. This is Jaime and Maricela. They just came to know the Lord. And there were some people there that were loading up bread to take to their neighborhood. And they had filled their truck full of bread. And they still had about 100 bags of bread, it seemed like, to take to their neighborhood, but they were out of space. And in introducing Jaime and Maricela to these people, they realized they lived about a block away from each other. They live about a block away from each other. And Jaime that day was driving a big van. And so within 20 minutes of them accepting the Lord and becoming part of our Christian family, we filled their van full of bread, and they got to take bread to everybody on their street. And I was so excited because it's like, this is just the way it felt so like New Testament to me, right? Like this is the way that it should be. You know, you come to know Jesus and then immediately God puts you to work feeding the people in your neighborhood. It's like, yes, that right there, that right there is the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you another story. My grandfather, Grandpa Ray, was a deacon at a Baptist church for a long time. And when he was younger, they did this thing where they, they bought this old school bus at their church and uh, up in, in Washington State. And they would go to um, really the poorest areas of their community on Sunday morning. And they played a song over a loudspeaker from the bus, kind of like an ice cream truck. And all the kids from those families would come get on the bus. This was in the 60s and 70s. It was a different time, right? But they would come get on the bus. And uh, my grandpa and some of the other deacons would drive the bus to church. And the kids from all of these families would get to go to church. And they were excited because it was something to do on a Sunday morning. And my grandpa and the other deacons felt like it was what they were supposed to do. And they, they uh, reserved the first few pews of the sanctuary in their church. And all these kids from these poorer families would line up in these pews and watch the sermon. They had no idea what was going on, but they would sing the songs. They learned the songs over time. And, you know, they would be there and watch the sermon. And they were excited to get on the bus and go to church on Sundays. That's the kingdom of God right there. But uh, one day... Some of the kids, um, the night before, Saturday night, they bought a couple bags of popcorn. And they put it in their coats when they got on the bus. And they snuck popcorn into the service on Sunday morning. And when the pastor started to preach, the kids took their popcorn out. And they started to eat popcorn like they were at the movies. And these kids were so excited. Not only are they at church and they got something to do on Sunday, but they've got popcorn now, and it, they were just over the moon. The problem was the church was worried about popcorn grease and those little popcorn seeds on the carpet. And some of the people in the church got together, and they decided that my grandfather and the other deacons couldn't go get those kids and bring them to church anymore because they were worried that they would damage their facilities. And that is not the kingdom of God. The next story I'm going to tell you is about a very large man in body and spirit named Pastor Bob from uh, a church over in Rio Grande City. Um, a few years ago, somebody connected with our church. Uh, their child got very sick, very sick. And one of our students from our student ministry decided that she was going to organize a sporting event in order to raise money for this family so that they could pay their hospital bills. So she organized the sporting event, and our youth group went to help clean up garbage and things like that at this sporting event. And Pastor Bob and about 20 people from his church all the way from Rio Grande City came into town to help out with the event as well. And... We were there getting everything ready, and Pastor Bob got out of his car, and he had a red Make America Great Again hat on. And all of our youth group, you could hear like this audible gasp, <gasps> okay? 
because it was like 2017, 2018, that whole political tension in our country was just starting to get going, right? Pastor Bob comes out of the car and he's got his red MAGA hat on. What you have to understand, the reason why that was a bit of a shock is the family with the child who was sick were undocumented immigrants. And so right there, just based on everything that was going on in the news and everything that everybody was talking about, we were just on pins and needles, like all of you are right now, right? Like, why would we even talk about this? And then to see it in person. And I had a couple of our students come up to me and say, you need to tell that guy to take his hat off. I'm not telling him anything. Uh, he's bigger than me and he can hurt me, right? Uh, but also, you know, it's a hat. But I understood where they were coming from. They were, they were tense and we were trying to do this thing for this family that needed help. And that wasn't really like the image that we were looking for on that day. And then Pastor Bob was chosen to stand up in front of everybody and pray for this family and pray for safety as we started the sporting event. And Pastor Bob took off his MAGA hat and started to pray. And by the time he was done, I was almost in tears. He called down all the blessings of heaven onto this family without reservation, without any kind of judgment. He just prayed for this child who was sick. He prayed for the well-being of the family. He prayed for their financial well-being. And the rest of the day, he and his people treated that family and treated us with the utmost respect and care because all they cared about was that this child get better and that we help out this family in their moment of need. That is the kingdom of God too. It was a long time ago. I was a youth pastor at another church. Um, and we did our vacation Bible school. And so we had a community program for the kids of the community. And I was walking through the place where the first and second grade class was on my way to go set up something that somebody else needed because usually youth pastors are kind of the handymen and the maintenance men when it comes to VBS. And I heard one of the teachers of this class say, hey, there's Pastor John, let's ask him. Oh no, right? I, I'm gonna get a question from a bunch of first graders and second graders. Well, what they were learning about that day was that verse in Romans where it says, the wages of sin is death. And some of these first and second graders had asked, what does that mean? And I was walking through, and uh, these teachers didn't want to answer it, so they just punted it to me, right? So, you know, I was freshly out of Bible school, and I said, well, if I can't explain this to a bunch of first and second graders, what good am I as a pastor, right? So I'm about to explain how when Adam and Eve sinned, they brought death and destruction into the world because that was the best way I could think of to explain this to first and second graders. And I started with, everyone raise your hand if you've ever had a goldfish die. Okay? Somebody raised their hand back there. I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, and this little girl put her hand up, and I could see the teachers behind her start shaking their heads and going like this. Because this was that kid at Vacation Bible School that is always running when you're supposed to be standing still and is always touching things when the adults are telling you not to touch things and is always talking when the adults want you to be quiet. And they didn't want me to open the door for her to start disobeying and, and misbehaving in that moment. But I thought, ah, she's a little girl. She's going to tell me about her goldfish. And I said, yeah, what's your name and why don't you tell me about your goldfish? And she burst into tears, and she said, I had a baby brother, and he just died, and I think it's my fault, but nobody will tell me that it's my fault, and I don't feel like I'm pretty anymore because everyone in my house is sad, and I try to make everybody happy, but I can't do it. And then, sobbing tears. And it's like, boy, we just stepped on a landmine, right? And so I went and gave her a hug. And we brought her to the back, and we went and got the pastor's wife. And the pastor's wife came and talked to her. And it turned out, that, yeah, this family had just lost their youngest son. And they hadn't processed it as a family. And they hadn't talked to anybody. And this little girl was carrying the tension of this loss around on her shoulders. 
and it was affecting her identity as a human being. And that day, the pastor's wife got to work with her and talk her through, this little eight or nine-year-old girl, talk her through all of these issues that she was struggling with. And then when her parents came to pick her up, the pastor's wife was able to talk to the parents and figure out what they were going through. And they ended up being able to minister to this whole family just because I had made a misstep in front of all these kids, but we had actually taken the time to figure out what was causing the misbehavior and why she was upset. That right there in that family's life was the kingdom of God. In 1493, the Pope uh, issued a papal bull, which is a fancy way of saying a letter, to all of the Spanish explorers that were headed into the New World after Columbus. And it was called, uh, let me make sure I get this right, it was called the Interchitera. The Interchitera was this papal bull that told the Spanish explorers, that wherever they went, if they found people living on an island or on a continent, and these people had never heard of Christianity or Catholicism, that as Spaniards from Europe with a superior culture and a superior te uh, technology, the Spanish explorers were by rights sovereign over the people that they met and that they were allowed to do whatever they wanted to the people that they found. And that papal bull, that letter that the Pope issued, that decree, was the religious framework and religious foundation for like 300 years of slavery and abuse uh, and all kinds of exploitation and evil. But the Spanish, when they went out into the world, they really believed that they were carrying the kingdom of God with them. And they really believed that because they knew the name of Christ already, and these people, these tribes that they were visiting didn't, that it was their responsibility to evangelize those people and bring them into what they thought of as the kingdom of God. And when it came to the Aztecs, that meant that the Spanish and the Aztecs ended up in this giant bloody war. It meant that Lots of different tribes in Mexico and in South America were enslaved. It meant that indigenous cultures, languages, and art forms were all erased and that Spanish Catholicism replaced it. And they had priests all along the way blessing all of that work as the expansion of the kingdom of God. But if you're the person that the kingdom of God is landing on, does that feel like the kingdom of God that Jesus talked about? No, it doesn't. And so that papal bull, that letter that the Pope issued in 1493 was meant to expand the kingdom of God all around the world to people who had never received it. What it did was it actually blinded millions of people and killed millions of others and created a situation where in certain places it's still to this day almost impossible to communicate the kingdom of God because people don't want to hear it because of their history of abuse. Uh, and as a missionary and being on the mission field, I've actually met those people, the Taramara tribes in northern Mexico. After their contact with the Spanish, they wrote it into their religion that brown people like them were created by God and white people like me were created by the devil and that no self-respecting brown person should ever have anything to do with a white person like me. So because of what happened, it burned bridges for generations and caused these groups of people to separate from each other and hide in the mountains and completely lose any hope of hearing our message because it was burned for them at their first contact. And that is not the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God is this. John chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. 
Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it was written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. You guys see how that's funny? If you're a king, do you show up on a donkey's colt? No, what do you show up on? What do you show up on? A white war horse. So everybody knows you're king. If you're a king and you show up on a donkey's colt, that's either a joke or you're crazy. Right? It's either a joke or you're crazy. And that whole prophecy of Jesus coming into the city riding on a donkey's colt was prophesied by the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. He writes, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So if that's the kingdom of God, it's got no weapons. The chariot was like the battle tank or the Apache helicopter of that time. It was the super weapon. This king that's coming doesn't want anything to do with that. Bows and arrows were artillery and sniper rifles. King doesn't want anything to do with that. His dominion is to the ends of the earth, but it's a dominion of peace. You know what that means? This kingdom has no borders. There's no line where you can say there's the kingdom and there's not the kingdom. It's everywhere. And so just by reading all of these stories and talking about all these stories and sharing my experience, this is what we know about the kingdom of God so far. The kingdom of God is the generosity of strangers and the joyful breaking out of new life and new possibility. The kingdom of God is our compassion and care for people who we are supposed to hate. The kingdom of God is the honest excitement of children and the healing of their sorrow. It's a Messiah on a donkey's colt, a king who wears a crown of thorns, a king who breaks bows and spears and swords of violence and worldly power and establishes a kingdom of peace without borders and without war. And this kingdom is all around us, and it's here among us, and it's within you and me right now. And we can live in it right now if our souls are patient and we look for God's kingdom with eyes of faith. But we will miss it and all of its joy if we're not present in the moment and ready to respond to the kingdom when it appears right in front of us. If we're always dreaming about our plans and the things that we're going to do for God, we're going to miss what God is doing for us right in front of us. If we're worried about popcorn on the carpet, we're going to miss the kingdom of God. If we let politics divide us, we're going to miss the kingdom of God. If we're too scared to get tangled up with the emotional needs of the little people who are crying out to us, we're going to miss the kingdom of God. And if we try to put the world in order based on our own plans or organization and power and what we think it means to be king, we're going to miss the kingdom of God. And that's because... The kingdom of God is on its way, and when it comes, it will be a cosmic manifestation of the glory and power of God, but it's not here in that form yet. Right now, it's an inside joke. It's an inside joke. It's a joke that you get if you know it, and it's a joke that you don't get if you don't know it, because our kingdom is a kingdom of kids with no money and sticky hands, right? What kind of a kingdom is that? Not one that we would choose to build, and yet that's the one that God chooses to build among us right now while we wait for the big one. Our king rides a donkey instead of a war horse, and he wears a crown of thorns. And he, his coronation is his crucifixion on the cross. What kind of a kingdom is that? It's not the one that you or I would choose to build, and yet that's the kingdom that God chooses to build among us. We have no capital city. We have no palace. We have no army. We have no treasure. And yet our kingdom is a worldwide kingdom and it's present everywhere if you know where to look. What we have, instead of all those things, is joy and life and all the power and presence of God among us if we can learn to see the kingdom. That's where we're going to leave it today. We have a lot more to do when it comes to recognizing the kingdom. Like I said, we're going to talk about the kingdom's math. We're going to talk about who gets to come in and who can't come in. We're going to talk about all those things. But right now, what I want us to understand is that the kingdom of God is not some place you can point to and not something that we're supposed to build. It's an inside joke. And if you pay attention, it'll pop up right in front of you every single day, every single day. 
and I've seen it right here on this grass. It was here on this grass last week after we were done with all of our Easter stuff, and the kids started their bubble party, and we had a whole bunch of little kids here running around and blowing bubbles and filling this with bubbles like it was a snowstorm. That was the kingdom of God. That was the kingdom of God right there. I'm going to tell one more story just to wrap this up. So um, as you all know, I got pretty sick earlier this year. And right as I was just starting to get better, I think I leaned up against a tree and I got poison ivy all over my arm. And if you saw it, it was pretty gross. I had all these blisters that were like pussy and stuff. It was pretty bad. And then, you know, after a couple weeks, it went away just like poison ivy does. And now I'm good. And so um, I didn't think too much about it. But the other night when I was tucking my daughter into bed, I said, can I ask you something? And she said, yeah. I said, when I was sick earlier this year, was that scary for you? She said, yeah, but you know what was the scariest thing? I said, what? She said, when you had leprosy on your arm. The leprosy? She said, yeah, well, we were watching the Jesus show, The Chosen, and he, he cures a leper. And those blisters that you had looked just like the leprosy on the show. I said, yeah, they did. I said, that wasn't leprosy. And just so you know, like when Jesus, you got to take advantage of these moments with your kids, right? Because that's the kingdom of God. I said, you know, when Jesus healed these people who were lepers, he wasn't just healing their physical body. They weren't allowed to live at their house and, and be with their family and touch anyone. And so when Jesus healed these lepers, they got to come back inside and be part of their family again. And that was like the big part of that healing. It wasn't just that their arm was better. It was that they got to be around their family. And my daughter started to cry. And I said, what's the matter? And she said, dad, even if it was leprosy, we wouldn't make you live in the street. You could still live in our house with us. And even though we're not supposed to touch you, I would still give you hugs. And I would still let you hug me. And like, you know, it's not fully formed yet, but that's the kingdom of God right there, right? She was worried about me. She thought I had leprosy. She never brought it up. <laughs> and then she told me later that, if the law said that I had to leave my house and live on the street because I had leprosy, she would rebel and she would make sure that I had a spot at our home. Just look around. The kingdom of God is everywhere and it's right here among us too. It's an inside joke. And if you get it, you get it. And over the next few weeks, we're going to work on making sure that everybody can get it so that we can see it when it appears. Amen? All right.